The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the second chapter. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men came from the east, and they came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it had been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where Jesus was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, They left for their own country by another road. The Gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. Please pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as we heard earlier, um, today we celebrate Epiphany. This is the day that we typically read the story of the three wise men in the Gospel of Matthew. And it's a day of great aha moments. Um, So to get at these moments, I'd like to do a little bit of learning about a couple of words. First, the word Epiphany. Um, The word epiphany comes from the Greek word epiphanane, which means to reveal. Um, This is the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles as represented by the Magi. So Christ is made known to Gentiles through the Magi. Um, uh, Epiphany is a festival that commemorates this occurrence on January 6th. Um, It's also a manifestation of a divine or supernatural being. And finally, epiphany can mean a moment of sudden revelation or insight, an aha moment. We celebrate on epiphany also the visit of the three wise men or three magi to the baby Jesus. Now, wise men, of course, we use, this would indicate that they were well-educated, very learned, Um, and probably had a lot of worldly experience, um, a lot of understanding about the ways of the world. But what is the origin then of the word magi? Magi came from magos, and that was actually influenced by an earlier word, a Greek word, uh, goes, Um, and this was a word used for the practitioner of magic. So in that day and time, A magi was someone who had an understanding of astronomy or astrology or alchemy, um, other forms of esoteric knowledge. And so it's interesting that the way that we use a magician today is very different. Back then it was very scientific because they understood some of the mysteries of the world. Today, magician seems to try to keep the mystery, doesn't it? So it's a little bit of opposite. So when we think about magi um, and the word magician, really at that point, it just meant that they had an understanding of things that were typically unexplained. And they were very scientific about it. Sometimes during Epiphany, we even use the word king. And in fact, in our little nativity sets, often the little three wise people that come have little crowns, and we call them the three kings although there's not really any indication in the New Testament that they were kings. Um, 
Perhaps we assume that because they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which were very, very expensive gifts and probably things that only kings and very wealthy people could afford. Um, we actually don't even know how many there are. We assume or use the number three because of the gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But there are some Christian churches around the world that actually celebrate 12, 12 kings. And we, um, even though we don't really know how many they, they, there are, We also know that these men likely came not the night or even uh, the week of Jesus' birth. If you listen to the words in Matthew, it talks about visiting the child, not the baby. Um, And this would have given time for word to begin to spread. They had come because they had seen the star, and they come to the Roman ruler of the time, because, of course, that's who you would go to seek information, was from the actual rulers of the area. So they go to the Roman ruler who had not heard yet the story of Jesus. And so, of course, Herod freaks out and thinks that uh, this is probably bad news. Um, And so then he creates an edict to have all the babies under the age of two killed, and they go to find the baby. So it would have been a lot more uh, time that had passed probably closer to two years, because this is also before Joseph and Mary fled to Egypt for safety. So there's a lot of epiphanies or aha moments, even when we really break down this story. Um, And and it really helps us understand a little bit more about Jesus' first few years. Some of these aha moments are um, that that epiphany means, because it means reveal or a revelation of insight, our revelation here is that Jesus wasn't just for the Jews, that Jesus came for all people. So not just the chosen people, because the Jews were expecting a Messiah for the chosen people, but this is a real early indicator, um, as Jesus isn't even grown up yet, that this message, this gospel message, is going to be for everyone, not just a certain group of people. And this would make sense because the Magi weren't Jewish. The Magi came from another region, Um, They were understood, again, to be astrologers or astronomers, scientists, so to speak. And they came to see what this new star meant. So they likely studied and read and had heard some of the stories and some of the prophecies before. But they came to figure it out because this wasn't their own history or their own story. They were Gentiles. And so if we really look carefully at what Matthew is doing with this story in his gospel that he has written to a Jewish audience, he's kind of setting the stage for comparison for the delivery of people from slavery. If we think back to Exodus, the last time people needed to be delivered from slavery was this slavery in Egypt. And and so God sends Moses to deliver the people from slavery. But if you remember, at that time, the babies under the age of two were all killed by Pharaoh. Moses' mother saves him by putting him in the basket and putting him in the river. But all the other children were killed under the age of two. So we come to this story in the New Testament, and now once again, a foreign ruler is putting to death all these young children and babies because of their fear of being overcome, of their rule being overcome. Now, the difference is that Moses was delivering people from slavery to Egypt. Jesus has come to deliver people from slavery to sin. So there are some similarities in the story, but yet it also reflects this newness, this change for the Jewish people to say, this isn't just for us anymore. This is a covenant for all people, a new covenant for us. So, On Epiphany, we celebrate a number of aha moments through this story of the baby or toddler, the child Jesus, and what those mean for us as followers. But what about today? I often have people say things like, I just wish God would speak to me a big cloud or send an angel or come to me in a dream and tell me what I need to know or what I need to do or how to understand something. But even though we don't have those big voices or those dreams necessarily, we do still have epiphany moments. Maybe some of what you learned this morning even is an aha moment for you about your faith. 
Maybe there's been another time in life that your faith had an aha moment. One of mine was when I first uh, became a youth minister uh, back in 1996. I had gone to school to become a veterinarian and then decided kind of late in the game that maybe I would do education instead. So then I student taught in the fall of uh, 96 and realized, hmm, this was kind of a rough semester. I don't think I want to start teaching in the middle of a school year, and I'm not really sure what I want to do. So I took some time off from teaching to figure out what I wanted to do, and in order to earn some money, because we were newlyweds at the time, I thought, well, I'll take this part-time youth ministry job at MacArthur Park Lutheran Church. What I didn't know when I took the job was that they had just been through a five-year period of of transition. They had their senior pastor and founding pastor had retired after 30 years in 1991. And so they had gone through several interims and there were several issues and they'd gone through several youth directors and there were several issues. And so my first night of youth group, I had a teenager look me square in the face and say, so how long are you going to be here? And I was like, well, a lot longer than I thought I was going to be here. (laughs) But this was my call to ministry. For me, this was an aha moment of, oh, this is what God wants me to do. So it was an aha moment of faith for me. We still have them. They just don't necessarily sound like maybe what we read in the Bible. But I'm going to ask you to do something very risky this morning, very, uh, very scary. I'm going to ask you to think of an aha moment perhaps in your own faith life when something about your faith finally made sense or something was finally revealed to you. And then I'm going to ask you if you might be so bold as to share it with a couple people uh, sitting next to you. So I'm going to give you one minute to share an aha moment about your faith with someone sitting next to you, because these are our stories of faith. These are our aha moments, just like the epiphany story can have an, uh, can give us some understanding about our faith. So can your aha moments. So I'm going to give you one minute to share an aha moment with the people sitting next to you. And then, I'll, and then we'll move on. All right, I hate to interrupt your moment. If you haven't finished your story, please share it with someone or finish it after the church service. I've lost all control. And And if you think of one later in the service, please feel free to share it with someone just because you haven't been given permission in the worship service doesn't mean you can't share it later. That's the whole point, right? We're all little priests or pastors that get to preach all the time, which actually... Reminds me of, uh, of another one of my own aha moments. Believe it or not, um, the, it, it took me a really long time to go back to school to become a pastor because I was afraid I wouldn't have anything to say every week. <laughs> yeah. And now I can't stop talking. But, <laughs> but I was re- this was a real fear of mine, was to have to preach every week, and I really just didn't think there was that much to say. And so I went to a seminary, and my first class during J term was an introduction to preaching class. And our professor gave us a passage from John, John chapter 18, and it was like 18 verses long. And we spent the whole week on this one passage talking about all sorts of different things. We practiced reading it so that it was like telling a story instead of just reading 
And then we each had to submit a one-line sentence about what we might preach on if we were going to preach this text. And, we, and then after we turned those in, we had to share with the rest of the group. And it was such an aha, mo- aha moment for me when 22 people turned in 22 completely different sermon ideas about the same passage. And then I thought, okay, maybe I can do this. Maybe this is going to be okay. That was an aha moment for me again in faith and understanding that there's so much to this story we might not ever be able to finish telling it. So we all have these aha moments, and I wonder what will be our aha moments in 2023. I don't know that we can actually expect them. We know that they'll probably come, but when we're expecting them, uh, they just tend to surprise us more than anything else. And I don't think we really look for them, but we can prepare ourselves for aha moments. The way that we prepare ourselves is to open our hearts for them. When we gather here, when we study, when we pray, when we sing, when we love our neighbors, when we open our hearts, we open ourselves up to these aha moments where God comes in and reveals things to us. Just as God came to all the people on Epiphany, not just the Jews, but to all people to show us that God's love is for all. Amen.